and you know we start changing these attitudes. We also do a lot of work with fishermen. We we do a lot of campaigning. You're going to see that's where we've had most of our success. And one of our greatest successes has been working in um, the shark finning issue, which is one of the issues we work on, but it's been one of the issues that we've had a major impact on because I can't say it, it's been easy, but it's just something terrible that's being done, and many people have been turning a blind eye. So we. You know, we exposed the situation in Costa Rica and then we got global attention, as incredible as it sounds. And we've actually been able to push this issue to many international forums and, you know, we're actually changing policy. So it's, it's a very exciting time for us. Um, I got an award in, in San Francisco, United States, last April, and now I got this one. So 2010 has been a roller coaster ride. You, know, we, you never do this kind of work expecting you're going to get a, an award. I'm very passionate about my work. I love turtles. I love sharks, and these awards are a surplus. It's an extra, and it's definitely very gratifying. Thanks, and it also helps project us to, you know, to, to, to get the word out, to do our work more globally. So it's very exciting to be here in Sweden, and I hope, um, I hope I can continue coming and developing relationships with NGOs here in, in Sweden. This is a very exciting time. So. Yeah, so check my website. We, we also do satellite tracking of sea turtles and sharks. I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. You can click on, you can get up um, over here on that button there. It says sign up to get news. And then every week or every other week, you get um, news or updates of our campaigns and what you can do to support us. And, you know, to urge you also to take your own actions. So um, now I'm going to talk to you specifically about our shark cleaning campaign, how it all started. And my organization is called Pritoma, which means Sea Turtle Restoration Project. And you would say, well, if you're sea turtles, why are you doing all the shark work now? And sometimes people tell me, you should change your logo and put a shark on it. It's like, well, you know, you look at WWF's logo, it has a panda bear. They don't only do panda bears, they do all sorts of work. So we always use the sea turtle to represent that we do marine work. But uh, yeah, we're more, we're, we become very well known for the shark work anyway, but I'll tell you all about it. So, as I mentioned, how do I turn on here? Shrimp. Everybody loves to eat shrimp, and this is how I got started. Not eating shrimp, but because shrimp uh, in the tropics, fishing shrimp is a major problem for sea turtles. See, in the tropics, like I guess over here too, when you catch, when you catch shrimp, you, you use these big boats that tend to be 90 or 120 feet long, 30 meters, and then they have these two arms, and on each one of these arms they have a trawl net. Now, the trawl net is dragged on the bottom of the ocean. They have two of these nets, one on each side. And this can be 30 meters wide by 5 meters high. And it has a chain on the bottom right here. And this chain is dragged on the bottom of the ocean. And it literally scrapes the bottom and picks up everything. It's like a vacuum cleaner. Nothing gets away. And only about 5% by weight of everything that is caught in this net is shrimp. The other 95% is called bycatch and most of it is thrown away. It's, it's one of the most unsustainable fishing practices. It's even worse in the tropics. And of course, what caught my attention was the impact on sea turtles. Around the world, it's estimated that 200,000 turtles are caught by the shrimp trawl industry in the tropics per year. And most of these turtles die drowned because turtles can hold their breath for about 50 minutes or an hour. But when they trawl these nets on the bottom of the ocean, they can trawl the nets for five or six hours. So the turtles are down there eating shrimp. They get caught in these nets and then they can't breathe. So they die by suffocation. Now, not all the turtles are dead when they drag them up. Sometimes they're still alive, but then the fishermen are supposed to follow protocols. Bring the turtle on board, wait until it drains the water from its lungs, and you have to wait until the turtle is fully recovered, and then you throw the turtle back into the water. But many fishermen don't really care. The turtles come up sometimes and they're comatose or they're you know, they're almost dead. If you let them recover, they'll get better. But they just get them and throw it back into the water again. So the mortality is actually higher than 50 or 60 percent. This is a Pacific green turtle. Here's an olive ridley turtle. And our major problem with, is with the olive ridleys because olive ridley sea turtles are carnivorous and they love shrimp. So their feeding grounds overlap with the shrimp fishing grounds. And in Costa Rica, our studies have demonstrated that the Costa Rican fleet catches about 15,000 turtles a year. That sounds like a lot, but that's because Costa Rica also has some of the main nesting beaches in the world. We have you know, two nesting beaches for olive ridleys, which are 
um, two of the main nesting beaches in the world. We get 100,000 turtles nesting in two or three nights on these beaches. So, so th this is the problem. So I started working very intensely with this fleet to, for them to use what we call turtle exploring devices. Uh, but then the fishermen would tell me, okay, Randall, so here you are bugging the shrimp trawlers, bugging us, the shrimp trawlers. They operate in coastal waters, and it's only a fleet of 55 boats in Costa Rica. But then the shrimp trawlers would tell me, and this is in the late 90s, Randall, you give us such a hard time. You're always honest because of the turtles. But what about the longline industry? There's hundreds of longliners. They're coming all the way from, from Asia, and they kill many more turtles than we do. So why don't you go do something about them? And we thought, well, you know, good idea. Let's, let's go see what's going on at the long line industry. Now, a long line is, as the name suggests, a very long line. Sometimes these lines can be up to 150 miles long. And when they set these lines, these lines can have up to 5,000 hooks dangling from these ganges. And, of course, the hooks are baited. Mainly, they want to catch sailfish, swordfish, another type of fish we call dorado, mangi mangi which is a very popular fish in the tropics. We export it to the States. But then how can you keep sharks from biting these hooks? Sea turtles, which also you know, bite the hooks. Seabirds. And just like with the shrimp trawl industry, there's a big problem with bycatch. Okay? So we, we decided, well, we need to study the bycatch problem. And of course, we we're more interested in the turtles. We wanted to see what the impact was on the sea turtles, if it was really a problem. So a friend of mine got a job on one of these long line boats, so this is 1997. Because enabled to, to be able to see what's going on, you need to put an observer on the boat. But when you put observers on the boats, fishermen tend not to like it. They're afraid, they think we're going to get them in trouble because they're doing anything illegal, they're not using the right technologies. So we really have to do a lot of convincing to get on these boats. And these were the early days in the 90s, so we didn't really know the fishermen very well yet. So we, we just couldn't hop on board. So this friend of mine got a job as a cook, and when he got the job, he called me and said, Randall, I got a job on one of the boats. Get, get me a video camera. And this is 1997. Video cameras were not like today, that everybody had one. So I had to call a friend in the States, and he sent me this huge video camera back in 97. Like I said, it still had a VHS cassette, one of those great big ones. But anyway, we put my friend on board. When he came off the boat three weeks later, he brought some very disturbing footage. Sea turtles on the long lines, sea lions, Amolas, which are these big moonfish that we call, all sorts of bycatch, which is very disturbing. But at the very end of the video, he brought this. Now back, this is 1997, I know nothing about sharks. And I see this happen. shark finning and they fin the sharks to provide the Asian market for shark fin soup and of course very very disturbing. We launched this campaign in 2001. We put this um, video on Costa Rican TV. This was on the main Costa Rican channels for at least three weeks. One channel had it for several months and it created a major change in the attitude of the Costa Rican people. Before this video, we would tell the Costa Ricans, we need to save the sharks, you know, blah, blah. And the people would say, why save sharks? You know, dolphins, yeah, okay, dolphins are cute and they smile and they're cuddly. And turtles, it's easy to sympathize with the turtle. But sharks? And lots of people would say, wouldn't it be better if there would be no sharks? That way I can go swimming in the water and not worry about a shark eating me like in the movie. And, you know, lots of people just thought the ocean would be better without sharks. But when they saw this footage, the first reaction of everybody in Costa Rica was pobrecitos, which means poor things. Because here's this creature that you're afraid of, you know, this magnificent predator, and then you see it reduced to a piece of meat and they hack off the fins and throw it away to, to slow us, to die slowly and cruelly on the bottom of the sea without any fins. It's very sad, it's very cruel, but it's also a very unsustainable fishing practice. And that's when we, that's when we put everything together. Why do we have so many boats in Costa Rica coming from all over Asia? They're here to catch sharks with, well, they're there 
to catch sharks with the fins. And during this shark finning process and shark extinction process, turtles are also caught and are also killed, but they're caught and killed as a bycatch. So they're a collateral damage and the turtles, and of course the sharks are the victims. But the whole impact, I mean the whole ecosystem is being impacted. It's not a turtle issue, it's not a shark issue, it's an overfishing issue. And that's when we finally put it in our head. If we really want to save the turtles, we have to make this fishery more sustainable. And if we can control or stop the shark finning, it won't only help the sharks, it will help the turtles as well, and it will make the fishery more sustainable. So, sea turtles and sharks share one characteristic, or share a few characteristics, that make them like, common for management. You know, why, why are turtles and sharks in so much jeopardy rather than you know, other fish? And these are the traits that these share. They're long-lived animals. Sea turtles, you've probably heard, live up to 100 years. We really don't know, but we know that they're very long-lived. They might live more than that. Um, sharks can also live very long years. 15, 20 years is common for certain species. The other issue is that they don't reach maturity until late in their life. Sea turtles, some species 15, 20 years. Other species 30 to 50. That means they have to live for a long time before they even start having offspring. And once they start having offspring, they have to have offspring for many, many years. That's the way they work. Same thing with the sharks. Late maturation, they don't mature until four or five years into their life. And then they both have few offspring. So you see the shark here and it has 18 pups. You might think, wow, that's a lot. But the shark only has pups every other year. And when this shark is pregnant, She'll be pregnant for 9 or 12 months. Some species can be pregnant for up to 16 months. So it takes two or three years to produce a handful of offspring. But other fish, like cod or snappers or what we call bony fish, the more modern fish, every time they spawn, they spawn hundreds of thousands of eggs. So it's a very different strategy, you know, producing many, many eggs and producing millions of offspring because there's going to be lots of mortality, or produce very few offspring. You've also heard the stories about the turtles. Turtles lay 100 eggs, and only one makes it to adulthood. And because of that, they have to live these long lives to be able to produce enough offspring for the next generation. And because of that, the recruitment of the next generation depends mainly on the state of the adult population. If you have a healthy adult sea turtle or shark population, you're going to get a nice recruitment to the next generation. But if you have very few turtles left, or if you almost wiped out the sharks, it's going to take you a very long time for these sharks to recover, these animals to recover. In another, like let's say in a cod fishery or in a snapper fishery, if you leave the fish alone for a couple of years, they will rebound, they'll come back. With sea turtles or shark, if you deplete the population and then you, you have a strict management plan and you stop killing them for them to come back, it's going to take a hundred years. It's not going to take just a few years. So we really need to take care of what we have left. Because if we just say, oh, we'll just start replenishing them with the program next year, every year is going to be more and more difficult. This is going to take too much time, time that we don't have. Okay, now, why does shark finning occur? And it's all a matter of economics. A fisherman is going to get $70 for a kilo of shark fins. But the fisherman is only going to get 50 cents of a dollar per kilo for the meat of the shark. So let's say you're a fisherman, and one of the limiting factors when you're a fisherman is your holding capacity. So just to keep this in context, let's say you're a fisherman, and you go out with one of these baskets. This is your holding capacity. And I tell you, you can't come back to port until you're full. So you go out and fish, and you catch one shark. OK, you, you take the fins of that one shark. If it's a big enough shark, you get one kilo. But then the rest of your holding capacity is going to be full. You know, the other 29 or 30 kilos is going to be full of meat for which you're only going to get 50 cents of a dollar. And you already have to come back to port. But if you cut the fins off and bring the fin, only the fins of the shark, you're going to bring this holding capacity with only $70 um, kilo fins. And the rest of the meat you throw away. You don't want to waste your holding space with something that's so cheap. You'd rather use your holding space for a valuable product. So that is the urge. Well, that's what um, 
makes or fosters a fisherman to throw the sharks away. And, of course, as you go up the ladder, this gets even more profitable. The shark fins are sold in the Asian market for shark fin soup. And a, a bowl of shark fin soup in Asia can go for up to $150 a bowl. And in Asia, they even have specialized shark fin restaurants. So, for instance, here's um, Singapore. This is in Hong Kong. It's very common in all the Asian cultures to consume shark fin soup. And one of the things, too, about this industry is shark fins don't really taste like anything. Shark fins are cartilage. That's all it is. And cartilage is like gelatin. And what happens is the people who make the shark fin soup, the chefs are specialized, and the soup can be made out of anything. You can see up here, soup with crab meat, bamboo fungus, um, clear soup fungus, a scrambled egg. So the, the, the soup is supposed to be made in such a way that it's a nice broth with nothing in it. And it can have all sorts of flavors. But at the end, after the soup is made, the chef adds the shark fin noodles. The noodles are, literally speaking, they look like noodles of cartilage. So they put that inside the soup. That way there's some consistency. And it, it, that's all it provides. Consistency to the soup really has no flavor. And that's what it's all about. And this is a shark fin soup restaurant I went to in Thailand. And there was a whole street and rows of nothing but shark fin soup restaurants. And they were all packed. And part of the culture in Asia is, you know, lots of people say it's aphrodisiac for the Asians. And not really. In Asia, it's part of their culture because shark fin soup used to be reserved only for the elite, only for the emperors. Emperors and high members of the courts of, of China were allowed to consume shark fin soup. When the communists took over China after World War II, and when, when the Cultural Revolution occurred in the 60s, anything bourgeois was repressed. And of course, shark fin soup was harshly repressed. You know, the common people are not supposed to consume shark fin soup. And it wasn't a problem for many years. But of course, after the 70s, after their economy was opened, after Richard Nixon visited China, their economy has been improving. And over the last 30 years, there are now 300 million middle-class Chinese citizens who 30 years ago were poor. And now that they're prosperous, and now that they're freer, what do they want to do when they have more money? Well, it's a status symbol for them. For them, consuming shark fin soups means I'm prosperous. I'm doing well in business, so I consume shark fin soups. So it's like to show off, it's to show people how well they're doing. And also part of their culture is when, uh, when there's a marriage, the father of the bride has to buy all the guests shark fin soup. And that's a way to show I'm also prosperous, my daughter is prosperous, and this is going to be a prosperous family. So it's just a matter of, of culture and showing off and a status symbol. Of course, this is a joke, but this was part of a campaign just to show that when people marry, it also fosters the killing of sharks. And this is a part of a campaign to convince Asian people not to serve shark fin soups, shoot soup at weddings. Okay, so now we're going to go directly into the Costa Rican issue. In 1998, Costa Rica decided to allow Taiwanese boats to land and export their shark fins from Costa Rica. So these Taiwanese boats are operating all over the Eastern Pacific, not only Costa Rica. But Costa Rica is the hub. In other words, they're catching all these sharks, they're finning all these sharks throughout the Eastern Pacific. They land them all in Costa Rica, and then from Costa Rica they're re-exported um, through our ports. And in 2004, Costa Rica was the, more fain, uh, the fourth main shark fin exporter in the world. And this started disturbing the Costa Rican fishermen because the Costa Rican fishermen would say, Hey, wait a minute. This looks like the Costa Ricans are finning all these sharks. And it's not us, it's these international fleets. It's the international fleet from Taiwan. But of course, they land their products and when it gets exported, yeah. you, look, you look at the FAO statistics and it just says Costa Rica, shark fins going fourth place. So it looks like it's a Costa Rican industry. And this is what started disturbing the, the Costa Ricans. Okay, so as of February 24th in 2001, and this is when we got our campaign started, um, we were able to convince the authorities in working with a group of the fishermen that 
in order to avoid the sharks from being finned, we should just mandate or order that all the sharks that are landed in Costa Rica should have their fins attached. And so that way we're sure that they did not fin the shark. And this way we can guarantee the full utilization of the resource, you know, a more sustainable fishery. So this law was passed and you can see here how the fishermen land the sharks with the fins attached and they separate the fin at the dock in front of the inspectors. So this way we know there's no shark fin. But this was bogus. It was not being respected. We were getting calls all the time that people were landing shark fins. And in 2003, we decided we were going to take very strong measures against this. And we started doing more of our undercover operations with video cameras. And throughout 2003, well, starting on May, we caught this boat, the Yuda Ure, which was a Taiwanese Panamanian flag vessel, landing 30 tons of shark fins in a private dock in Punta Arenas. And after that, in, in Throughout 2003, we caught three more boats on video landing shark fins. We would get calls in the middle of the night. My friends would go to Punta Arenas, which is the main port, and they would sneak into the docks or they would get on roofs, rooftops next to the docks, and we would get this footage. And we were able to expose the situation. This law is being circumvented. Everybody's landing shark fins, especially these Taiwanese boats. And what's going on? And what we found out was, there's a big loophole, or not a loophole, I should say, there's a big omission within the Costa Rican authorities because according to our customs law, our customs law says that these um, boats, these, private, these international flag vessels, must use public docks to import their products because that's the only way the state can protect the public interest, which means taxes, public health, um, what's the other one? public security, migration, these are all, you know, very important issues and every country in the world has the same regulation. The importation of products must occur in a public facility. But when they use private facilities, for instance in Costa Rica, private property is protected by the Constitution and the Constitution is above any law. So how can you protect the public interest if, you know, you cannot abide by public administration laws, if you cannot if, if the area is not a public domain. It's impossible because if they're doing anything illegal, the owner of the dock can just say, get off of my dock. It's like me like, or an inspector going to your home. You can slam the door right in their face if you want. Then if you want a policeman to come into your house, a policeman can come into your house, but that doesn't make your house public domain. It doesn't mean your house can be abided by public administration laws. It's just a private property where you allow a policeman in, but you can also kick him out. Because if a, if a policeman wants to have that type of authority in a public, I mean in a private installation, he has to come with a court warrant. And of course, they're not easy to get. So that's when we found out, okay, so by using these private docks, the, the fishermen can easily circumvent any regulations. We exposed the situation and we started with our campaign with, let's just abide by the law. Why don't the Costa Rican authorities make these boats land in public docks like they're supposed to? And we get all sorts of excuses, and none of them are good enough. None of them mean that they're abiding by the law. Okay, so um, after we exposed this situation, then the Costa Rican authorities decided to change the law in November of 2003. After we caught all those boats, the Costa Rican authorities said, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, this is humiliating. We're, you know, we're, we're getting exposed to the world. So we need to create a better regulation, something that we can you know, really put a grip on. So what we're going to do is, we're going to allow the fishermen to land the fins separated from the body. But the inspectors are going to weigh all the fins, they're going to weigh all the bodies, and we have to make sure that the weight of the fins corresponds to a certain ratio to the weight of the bodies. And at first we said, no, no, that doesn't work. How can that be easier? Isn't it easier if you're a fishery inspector just to see the fin is attached? But now we have to weigh all the fins and weigh all the bodies and do a rule of thumb to estimate the, the weight, you know, if it's correct. And they said, but Randall, this is used in the Economic Union. And it's used in Australia. And it's used, you know, all over the world. So why can't Costa Rica use it? And we thought, well, okay, you know, I guess we can give it a shot. Uh, what's the ratio going to be? All over the world, in Australia, in the Economic Union, in the United States, the ratio is 5%. So that would mean, sorry that's in Spanish, 
If we assume that one of these sharks without the head and the guts and the fins, if we assume that these sharks weigh about 20 kilos, then that would mean that if you're a fishery inspector and you see the boat had 10 kilos of fins, that means that for each 10 kilos of fins, they have to land nine and a half shark bodies. But then we ask the Costa Rican authorities, okay, what's the ratio going to be? They said, well, in Costa Rica, it's going to be 12.7%. Well, that can only mean one of two things. The sharks in Costa Rica have fins that are three times bigger than anywhere else in the world, which is absurd to believe. Or number two, they're finning 60% of the sharks. So what's it going to be? And the Costa Rican authorities said, oh, no, no, we have studies. Uh, we have studies by the Association of Professional Biologists of Costa Rica. And believe it or not, these studies were supported and approved by WWF. And they said, how can Pertoma, a, a shitty little NGO from Costa Rica, how dare you uh, contend WWF? They're serious biologists. So we'd say, but all over the world it's 5%. Why is it 12.7% in Costa Rica? And of course, what this means is that for every 10 kilos of sharks that they land, the fishermen just fin six sharks right in front of you, but in Costa Rica you get a certificate that says you didn't fin any sharks. So this is when we decided we have to stop this. We need the Costa Rican shark fishing policy to abide by the best scientific information available and abide by the law. And neither of both were occurring under this situation. So we spoke to the Costa Rican congressman. We did quite a bit of lobbying throughout 2004. And in 2005, Costa Rica approved its new fishery law. And when the fishery law was approved, there's an article, Article 9, that says no shark finning. And in Costa Rica, all sharks must be landed with fins attached, period. There's no other system allowed in Costa Rica. So that way, we were able to impose the fin attached policy. And ever since then, Costa Rica then started with, with our new campaign, which is we can land sharks with the fins attached in Costa Rica, but what about the other nations? We need this to be a global policy. Sharks are um, highly migratory, and it won't work if we just use this progressive policy in one nation. We need this to be a regional and a global policy if we really want it to work. But this was our first victory, getting this article included in the law and shooting down these other regulations that just allowed for shark finning. And then, we took the issue to the United Nations. This is the United Nations consultative process on the law of the sea. And in June of 2007, I went to the UN as a Costa Rican delegate, and we called for a global ban on shark finning and the implementation of what has been known as the fins attached policy. And much to our satisfaction, in November of the same year, the United Nations General Assembly adopted this language in their fisheries resolution. And even though it's not binding, it was very important for us, for the United Nations, to do this general call because it gives us a very strong tool to start going now to binding forums and to push other nations into this. And we've been very lucky. Other countries have followed. Now we have El Salvador, Colombia, Panama, Ecuador, and very soon the United States will be using the same policy. And now we're going to the FAO and other forums because we're still working very hard for this to be a global policy. Actually, in the Economic Union, there's discussion right now about the same policy. Spain, which is the main shark finning nation in Europe, says, oh, we can't land sharks with the fins attached. It's impossible. You say, well, we do it in Costa Rica. And they say, oh, but it's very complicated to bring a shark with the fin attached. It takes too much space in the holding capacity. Like, no, it doesn't. You, you can, you know, partially cut the fin. You can bend the fin over. We do that in Costa Rica. And every excuse they come up with, we can shoot it down. But Spain keeps on insisting that they can't do it. And the way we see it is, this policy should be no problem at all if you're not finning. But if you're finning, it's a major obstacle. And we've also been taking this to a number of different fora. This is the IUCN Conservation Congress in Thailand. And same thing, we were you know, pushing for this type of, of, of resolution for this policy to be global. And then we also like to do protests also to call the attention of the Costa Rican people. We saw, you saw what we did on the TV, we got everybody stirred up. And in 2003, the Taiwanese government donated this bridge to Costa Rica. It's a $70 million bridge, and they had this big event. The ambassador of Taiwan was there, the president was there. There were at least 100 Costa Rican delegates, you know, very important politicians. 
And we showed up with a busload of people in a protest, and at first they wouldn't let us go through, but then we started doing all this noise, and the president said, okay, you can let the, you can let the Pratoma folks in, and they just asked us, be respectful. So we were. We would let them talk, and after they would finish their speech, we would start doing our chanting, and blah, blah, blah. And then a new politician would come, and we'd be quiet, let them speak. It was actually very polite, but, you know, we got the message across. And our message is not subtle. We're going straight to the attack. Um, this is in drawings, this is in Spanish, and this is in Chinese. But basically it says, shark finning plus shark fin soup equals donated bridge. So we made the connection. That's the reason why Costa Rica turns a blind eye to what's happening at the private docks. Because the Taiwanese are giving us bridges. You don't want to mess with your friends who are giving you all this money and bridges and everything. So let's just let them do it as long as they keep on giving us gifts. We also did this protest in front of the customs office in Punta Arenas, which is the main, um, the main port in Costa Rica. And over here we're being supported by the university students, school children, and this was very nice because people in the town come up and start supporting us. Then we did this other protest in downtown San Jose. And the same thing, people would come out from the, from the stores, people who were working, they'd come congratulate, uh, congratulate us, ask us for stickers, and. It's, it's very nice because then you see everyone starting to join and then you tell people go to my website and then more and more people want to get our news. And that's how you get the ball rolling. It takes a little while, but it eventually turns like into a snowball, like, it's, like in the cartoons. It gets bigger and bigger as it rolls down the hill. And our campaign is also says, no shark finning, we must abide by the law in the private docks. So we're not saying we want the Taiwanese fleet out because we are also uh, accused of being xenophobic. And we would say, we have nothing against the Taiwanese. All we want is the Taiwanese to abide by our laws. I have to abide by the laws. Costa Rican fishermen have to abide by the laws. Why are the Taiwanese fishermen special and they don't have to abide by the law? There's a very important omission here, and that's what we expose to the public in Costa Rica. Um, here I am meeting with the Costa Rican Congress in November. This was right before the fishery law was passed. And the fishery law actually first had a small article that you could have two ways of landing the sharks. You could either land the sharks with the fin attached, or you can use the percentage system. But we met with the deputies, the congressmen, and we convinced them that we had to shoot that down. That Costa Rica had to have a unique policy, which is fins attached, and we convinced them. And that's what allowed us then to go to the UN and to these other forums. And, yeah, it's, this has been really cool. I've been willing, winning several awards lately. This was my first one for the shark finning work in 2004. This is Princess Anne from, from England. And yeah, that's, that's my brother. <laughs> and at the end of our campaign, we were able to land 80,000 petitions on Costa Rica's president's desk. And if you're a politician, you might not agree with what we're doing, or you might not like us, and it can be very easy to blow off the environmental groups to say, ah, oh, he's just a long-haired hippie, environmentalists, you can easily brush them off. But if 80,000 petitions land on your desk, hey, you're a politician. You have to listen to this because that can mean votes. So it turns into an issue that you just can't brush off. Then we were able to get more than 60 Costa Rican NGOs and 30 of the most prestigious international NGOs to also write to the Costa Rican authorities on this call to stop the shark fin. We've also gotten a lot of attention in the press. You know, lots of people don't read the newspapers, but everybody reads the editorial cartoons. They were very important, and these are some of the editorial cartoons of the Costa Rican um, newspapers. This is back in 2004. Then in 2005, a group from Germany called Shark Project, they came to Costa Rica and they said, Randall, we really want to help you. How can we help you? And I thought, well, one way you could help me if, you know, we just expose the situation to the world and show the world that Costa Rica is promoting shark finning. And they said, well, we give out two awards a year, Shark Guardian and Shark Enemy. What if we give the Costa Rican president the Shark Enemy Award? Would you be okay with that? I said, yes, of course. So they nominated and the president won the Shark Award Enemy for 2005. It was given in January of 2006. And this, of course, again, created a lot of press in Costa Rica. The president got very upset, and yeah, we pissed a lot of people off. But we're not into this 
for politicians to like us. If they work with us, fine. But if we have to go against them, we'll go against them. We're here for the sharks and if, and the turtles. And if they're not helping us, then, then they're part of the problem. So, you know, who cares if we're being friendly and meeting, but if they're not doing anything about it, then they're not part of the solution. Here's another one. This one is uh, the shark running away with its children, and the shark is saying, and they say, we are the dangerous ones. Run, kids. And then, of course, wow, lots of things have been happening lately. 2010 has been a great year. I won this award, the Goldman Award, in 2010. It's um, an award granted by a foundation in San Francisco, California. It's a, a very important award. Again, we got a lot of press. And what these awards do is they revitalize the campaigns, they give us a stronger voice, and they globalize our campaign. And it gives us more credibility. And again, it's not that easy to just brush us off anymore. They know that now, for instance, they know that the people of Gothenburg, that the people of Sweden are looking, and that Europe is looking more closely now at what Costa Rica is doing. And that's a big concern for lots of the politicians, the image of Costa Rica. And after that, this was really great. I met with President Obama. Here, this is the Oval Office. And yeah, this was all over the press in Costa Rica. This again gives us a lot of credibility. And yeah, for me, this, this was great. I can't imagine. He was actually a pretty cool guy. And then as soon as I came back from the Goldman Award, President of Costa Rica, Oscar Arias, called me right away and said, Randall, we need to talk. He seems to be a friend of the Goldman family. And when I got the award, he was also very concerned because I met with him in 2007 when he, when he just started his term as president. And I told him all about shark finning. And he said, yeah, yeah, I'm going to help you. He never did anything. So I got the award and he finally met with me on May 6th. But his term was ending on May 8th. So there really wasn't much he could do, but at least the party that continued into the government is the same party. He can still pull a lot of strings, and things haven't been moving as fast as I wanted, but after I met with Arias, and I actually met with him twice, things have started moving. He got many ministers involved in the process. I met with a number of ministers during the last few months, and things are slowly moving. And just two weeks ago, the Minister of Agriculture of Costa Rica announced that as December 1st, the private docks in Costa Rica are going to be closed to the Taiwanese fleets. And we're not ready to celebrate yet because we've done this already. In 2004 and in 2007, we were able to close the private docks, but they were only closed for weeks. And then the authorities reopened the docks based on resolutions that have no, no legally binding content, but they would just do these what we call bullshit resolutions to reopen the docks again. That makes us go to court again. And every time we go to court, we spend a lot of money. It takes years for a resolution. And you know, it's just, it's like playing ping pong, going back and forth. And now that this announcement was made that the private docks are going to be closed, we launched this campaign right away. And it's called Muelles Privados Mejor Cerrados. And that means private docks, we're better off if they're closed. And here's one of these Taiwanese boats. Um, we can see the Taiwanese flag. These are flags of convenience. That's Panama, that's Belize. They're not really from Panama or Belize, but Panama and Belize have laxer regulations. So we call them rags of convenience. They just fly them because it's better for them, but it's not that they're really from these na nations. And this, of course, is a private dock, and it says, welcome foreign fleets. And it's an illegal activity. And of course, they're fitting all the sharks. And we're doing this now because we won't be surprised if they come up with another bullshit resolution before December 1st, like on November 31st or something. We know they're doing a lot of, a lot of lobbying. We know the shark fin industry representatives met with the high-ranking officers just a couple of weeks ago too, trying to convince the president and other officers that it's okay for the private docs to operate, that they are abiding by the law. So, you know, we know it's not going to be easy. So that's, when, that's why this Gothenburg Award is also coming at such a crucially important moment because now we can get the people of Gothenburg and more European groups to also put pressure on the Costa Rican government so that they know the world is watching Costa Rica and the world is expecting our nation to do the right thing. And the right thing is only abide by your customs law. That's all we're asking for. We're not asking for anything special. We're just asking for the authorities to stop giving the Taiwanese fleets the priority of not having to abide by the Costa Rican laws. That doesn't seem like much. But it has been. This campaign is almost 10 years old. 
we're this close to a total victory, and yeah, we, we hope that the Scottenburg Award is going to help us get there, and we hope we you know develop more relationships because after we stop the shark painting, um, that's not going to be enough. Stopping the shark finning is definitely not going to be enough because who cares now, you know, after 10 years, who cares if the shark has a fin attached? We have to stop killing so many sharks. We already know that around the world, it's estimated that the global shark populations have declined over 90%. These are the studies that we've been doing in Costa Rica. And since 1991 to 2003, the shark population declined 60%. And even though it kind of like came up here a little bit, this was a Nina year, the waters got a little colder, so there was a little more productivity, but then it came down again. But even so, you can see there's a clear trend in, in the decline in these populations. And even if the sharks have the fins attached, that's not going to save the sharks. We need to find ways to stop killing so many of them. And one way to do that is through marine protected areas. If we start saying, um, we need less boats in the ocean, that's not going to happen. Every year there's more boats in the ocean. In spite of the fishing crisis, fishing nations keep on increasing the fishing effort. So what we're trying to do is, well, let's just create areas that are crit critical habitats for sharks and let's not allow any fishing. This is Coco's Island in Costa Rica. Here's Costa Rica, here's Coco's Island. It's um, 500 kilometers away. It's way out there in the middle of the ocean. And there's a 12 mile no take zone around the island. And Coco's Island is one of the few places in the world where you can go and see hundreds of sharks on every dive and hundreds of big sharks that are 50, 70 kilo sharks. It's really one of the most amazing sites where you can dive in the world and see lots of big sharks, hammerheads, silky sharks, whale sharks, white tip sharks, all sorts of things. So there's no fishing in this 12 mile radius and now we're trying to increase this area, what, about at least uh, two or 300 percent and we have these two sea mounts that we also want to protect from fishing. And, of course, there's a strong opposition for this because the tuna fishermen, for instance, uh, refuse. They're fighting this proposal. Uh, we, we already have this proposal written. I'm working in a special government commission to try to get this approved. And it's an uphill battle. But anyway, we believe that these are going to be the solutions where we protect critical habitats like mangrove swamps where the sharks have their babies. The migratory corridors, they also must be protected. So those, that's the kind of work we're doing right now, and you know we hope to continue. So even if we obtain our final victory pretty soon in December, it still isn't over. We really have to work on shark management. We have to work on shark quotas. We have to work on marine protected areas. We have to somehow reduce the fishing effort through the creation of these marine protected areas. That's what's going to save the sharks. So thank you very much, and I hope we can you know you can keep on helping us because that's how Potoma works. You know we're a small group but our force comes from the people. And the more people we can get on board, the stronger we become. So I welcome you to be part of our campaigns. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very interesting uh, talk uh, about your work. And I hope uh, that we will have some questions from the audience. Yes. Anyone? Something you want to ask, uh, Randall? How can you make part of your Okay, well, if you go to my website and you click on the, on the Get News button, then you, know, you give us our, your email address, and then every week or every other week, we, we're updating our members with the work we're doing. And we're always asking people to sign our petitions or, or to write to politicians. But then that way, if you see what we're doing, then you know, we hope it also inspires you for ideas, you know, what, you know, what you can do from the distance. We've never worked with European groups before, but this could be an opportunity. For instance, we know now that uh, shark finning policy is going to be discussed in the Economic Union at the very early in 2011, and we really need to push for a fins attached policy. We know Spain is against it, so one way we can help from Europe is if you urge your representatives at the, the EU, Sweden is in the EU, yeah, if you urge your representatives that Sweden should push for the same policy in the EU meetings, you know, so that way you can make sure that Sweden takes a strong position to these to these fora. So that you know that would be a first way to help. And then there's many other ways. Like whenever we're asking for letters, it always creates a very good impression when we can get letters from all over the world, just you know, to show the politicians that you know these are global issues. It's not just something that 
is important for Costa Rica, but it's important for everybody in the world. And, you know, Costa Rica has a great reputation of being a conservation nation, and we need Costa Rica to stand up to that reputation. And, for instance, this shark finning issue in Costa Rica hurts that reputation. So, you know, we need the Costa Rican authorities to know that, that the world is looking, and the world probably doesn't think Costa Rica is that special anymore if they don't change these policies. And then, of course, it's also important to pat them on the back. If Costa Rica does do the right thing, then we need to send letters to the president and everything congratulating them, you know, and urging Costa Rica to take, you know, more and stronger steps. So it works both ways. We don't only complain, we also have to, you know, congratulate and, and acknowledge. Is your website .org or .com? .PRTOMA, Pritoma.org. So check my site. Um, Thank you for this new uh, petition, like you're expanding the lines that Yes, like we, we, we think we're going to get it. The proposal has already been submitted twice to the authorities. It has a lot of support, even from the president's office. But the fishery department has been strongly opposed. And the Inter-American Tropical Tuna Commission, which is a very powerful political and economic lobby throughout the Eastern Pacific, has also been against expanding this area. So again, we're fighting against major you know, political interests and economic interests. But I'm optimistic. I think we're going to get it. The proposal has been submitted twice. It's been shot down twice. And it's actually, as soon as I get back to Costa Rica, we're meeting again to, you know, to figure out our strategy because it's going to be submitted again very early in 2011. So yeah, we're, we're going to insist. We don't go away that easily. Is that you work in the mm -hmm. Sure. OK, well, for instance, this one over here, the no tuna farms, for instance. Um, now that we spoke about tuna, the tunas are getting overfished, and the scientific commission of the Inter-American Tropical Tuna Commission has already determined that the yellowfin tuna in the Eastern Pacific is being caught under the size of the maximum sustainable yield. So that means overfishing. So the scientists say, we have to reduce fishing. But every time the parties meet, they increase the fishing effort. They never listen to their own scientists. So it just gets worse and worse. So now that the tunas are smaller, all of a sudden we get this proposal where the tuna industry says, oh, we're going to do tuna farms because a, a farm in the ocean is like a farm on land. So what we're going to do is we're going to go at sea and we're going to catch the young tunas. And then we're going to put them in a cage and we're going to fatten them and then we're going to sell them. And then we think, hey, wait a minute, you're just shifting the fishing effort from the adults to the small fish. And guess what? Those small fish haven't reproduced yet. So you're just, fishing the, you're just shifting the fishing effort, and you're creating even a bigger impact on the population because you're taking fish that have not reproduced yet. So it's just fishing down the line. It's just like putting the rope around their own neck. But these folks in, the, in these industries are very short-sighted. It's just a matter of short-term profit. You know, who cares five or 10 years from now? That's somebody else's problem in the future. I need you know, the profit right now. So they, they propose to do these tuna farms in Costa Rica, and we stop them. And so now they're proposing this in Panama. So we're also helping the Panamanian activists with arguments on why we have to oppose these tuna farms. And what they tell you is, it's a farm. And it's not a farm. A farm is somewhere where you plant and then you harvest. This is taking from the wild, you know, before they reproduce, fattening and selling. So by no means it's a farm. So that's one of our issues. Here's another one. Oh, just went away, but that was a wetland. And this is a wetland in a wildlife refuge that we helped create. And the wetland is currently being threatened by a developer. He's been draining it and building roads. We've been filing complaints and you know, lawsuits, and nothing has happened. And recently, about like, what, in July, like two or three months ago, uh, this farmer hired a plane, and they sprayed chemicals all over the wetland and killed a whole bunch of fish and invertebrates. And that's when we said, OK, that did it. So we launched another campaign, and this, um, this wetland won an award from the Global Net Wetlands Network. And it was a negative award, and it calls Costa Rica's attention because, you know, again, we're supposed to be this great conservation nation, but we're not doing anything to conserve this wetland. So, you know, those are different issues that I work on. And, yeah, our website is very rich on information. You can just click anywhere and see what we're doing. But, yeah, we work on all sorts of different issues. Always sea turtles and sharks. Well. Thank you.
about the sharks? Um, do they catch all different types of sharks or prefer one or Well, the thing is, in the tropics, the fisheries are multi-specific. So you can't go out and fish and just catch one type of fish. It's very diverse, so you catch all sorts of things. So for instance, coastal fishermen, fish in mangrove swamps and you know, really close to the shore, uh, they want to catch bony fish, of course, but they catch lots of baby sharks that come in to reproduce. So they catch lots of tiger sharks and hammerhead sharks and um, smooth hound sharks. And you know, it's not their main catch, but of course it's income for them, so any one of these sharks that they catch, they sell. And same thing with the longliners. The longliners are out there to catch mahi-mahi or dorado or swordfish or you know, all sorts of billfish. They also catch sharks, but they're not targeting sharks, but they catch sharks anyway. And of course, at seventy dollars a kilo of fin, uh, a kilo of fins, you know, then they'll they'll keep the shark and take the fin. So it, they don't really target any shark in particular, but yeah, they can't avoid catching sharks. And any sharks they catch, they will keep. They actually call it a complementary catch. So yeah, that's that's why we have to work on protected areas and in reducing the fishing effort because you can't tell a fisherman don't catch sharks. It's impossible. If he's out there fishing, he's going to catch sharks no matter what. So that, that's what makes it you know, kind of difficult to manage. That's why we need the marine protected areas and, and other strategies, closed seasons or closed areas. Yes? One question that you must have had a lot of times is, do you never feel afraid? Do you feel unsafe? Um, actually, sometimes. Um, once in 1997 or 98, uh, there was a very bad issue with a South African um, citizen who was working on one of these turtle beaches and one of my friends got seriously beat up and apparently I was next on the list, but I got away from that one. He's, he's not in Costa Rica anymore. Um, now with this shark finning issue, it's, it's a little scary because you know we've also exposed drug dealing in these private docks and dealing with slaves in these private docks. So then you're, you start you know, stepping on very mushy terrain, you know, which is, you know, you don't want to go out there and call some of these guys drug dealers, but, you know, they are dealing with drugs and other issues. So it, it's, it's kind of a del delicate issue, but, yeah, sometimes my wife is concerned, tells me I should be a little more careful, you know, and let people know where I'm going or, you know, always be accompanied with someone because, yeah, we're messing around with, with you know, major economic interests and, you know, people who we know aren't really honest. But of course, all these awards and too, all the profile, you know, also makes you almost a public figure. Where, you know, if anyone would try to hurt me, you would actually, you know, help the campaign. <laughs> no, let's hope that doesn't happen. No, no I. <laughs> Why do you think you have managed to reach out in a good way? You made. I mean, you were quite famous, almost. I mean, there are lots of different small organizations uh, fighting for the environment and trying to do the same things as you're doing. Why do you think you have been so successful in that? Okay, well, that, that's a hard question, but I, I just hope that many of these small NGOs, there's many in Costa Rica very similar to Potoma, I just hope that this is an inspiration to them that you have to go for it. You know, you, you can't be intimidated, uh, you can't be discouraged. You know, we've been shot down many times by, you know, fishermen or politicians, our ideas have been shot down, like we, you know, we get something implemented and then, you know, they change the law, the regulation, as I just showed you. And you can't get discouraged. You just have to keep on going. I have a reputation of always fighting with everybody. You know, other NGOs in Costa Rica sometimes say, well, I don't want to be too close to you because you're always fighting, you know. You're... But it's not that I'm always fighting. It's just that I believe that, you know, kind of like what I think is I'm the lawyer for the sharks and the turtles. I represent them. That's my interest. It's not my interest to be friends with any politician or to be friends with other NGOs. My intention here is to save turtles and sharks. And nothing is going to stop that. And I see other NGOs that say, oh, but if you do that, you're going to piss this guy off. And we don't want the minister to be pissed off at us. And it's like, I don't care. If he's not doing the right thing, you know, I'm not here to be friends with any politician. And I'm friends with many politicians, but that's because they help me attain my goals. But if they're not going to help, then they're part of the problem, and I don't mind anybody getting pissed off at me, and you know, sometimes I see little NGOs worried about that, and I don't think you should be worried if you're doing the right thing and you're on the right track. You know, it's karma. Things will start falling in its place. This is, this is proof that it will happen.
Any more questions? Great. Well, thank you very much. You're a great audience. And yeah, check my website. Yeah, yeah. Be my electronic members. Okay. And call them electronic activists. Right. Great. Uh, I'm not sure when you have to leave or I, I was planning to make a quick tour or tour oh, sure, in the aquarium. If you want to join us, you're welcome. If you have to leave. Uh, well, actually, um, I haven't ordered. Uh, okay. Do you, we're going to eat lunch at 12 o'clock, okay. and maybe, are you leaving or not? Well, you have class at 12, 12.20. Okay. 12.40. Well, we can get to the penny group. You can get to the penny group. Maybe I can stay back. Would you rather run back to school and have lunch? Do the tour? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Actually, yeah, I must um, just have a second because I, I, did, I, did, I did think you had, didn't have time for lunch. I can okay. go and check, of course. Uh, if there's... But we can, we can do the tour. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Do you want to? Do the tour? Then we'll see what happens. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, we are not a large group, but we are several people that uh, will, of course, help uh, ask questions about the queries. Uh, we'll show you the Swedish or the Nordic uh, department, cold water aquarius, and the tropical department with coral reefs, seahorses, mangrove reef forms. Uh, I'm not sure if we should divide in, in smaller groups or if we just. What do you think? Jens, Jens, and David is also helping us. Uh, should, we, should we split up the group? I think so. Some go there, some go there. Yeah. yeah. Do you want to take the group? Yeah, right. Just for okay. so the What do we do with our coats? No, I can take the next.